Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to Main Street this morning. Uh, you know, the one good thing about wearing a mask is that you can't see that I'm frowning. So um, I am excited that everyone's here today. I'm happy to have you with me. I'm really sad that this is the last time that I'll stand before you. But as we begin worship this morning, uh, we just need to remember that we are blessed by God. We're blessed just because we're able to be here and to be able to, to worship together. And so let's accept that blessing and let's receive God's grace with this most, most love as it is given, we should receive it. Let us pray. Oh God of Christ, in Jesus, you came into the midst of the Galileans as one of them. You lived among them as a neighbor. You spoke to them as a friend. You welcomed them as members of your family. And you treated them as brothers and sisters. So come now into our midst, dear God, as you entered into Galilee. And give us that same grace that you welcomed all the people that you encountered. Allow us to be able to welcome you as neighbor, friend, and father. And allow us to accept that grace, receive it, embody it, and share it. We pray this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's stand and sing together. This is the day of new beginnings. And it's uh, hymn number 383. Okay, before we sing... Um, I'd like to take a moment to um, wish my daughter Stacia a very happy birthday today. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> and I would like everyone that had a birthday in June to raise their hand and we're going to sing to all of you. but I share a birthday with Dan Connor because oh. <laughs> his birthday is today. Okay, now we 
we've done this layers of the Bible uh, for a long time, at least since all my kids have been here. So um, each one of you received um, a bag with brown paper. Um, the first, what is it? First layer is brown paper. This signifies that the Bible is old. The words in it have guided mankind for a long time, so that it is often called or called the ancient wisdom. So what I want you to do now is take it out of the brown paper. Two of them. I'm open that one ripped a little bit. And pull that out. Then, then you'll have to undo that. The orange tree was out of brown paper, so I had to improvise. You get it? Right, you can rip it. Yeah, don't do anything else. Okay, that's well, okay. Keep it just like that for now. Actually, no, change my mind. Go ahead. Open open on the next get the next layer. I haven't done this in a while. <laughs> okay, now, what color is the paper now? Gold. Okay. Um, what are some things that are made of gold? Can you think of things that are made of gold? What did you say? Candlesticks. Yep, yeah, they can be made of gold. What else is made of gold? Jewelry, some people have some fancy jewelry, old coins, some statues, old statues are made of gold. <laughs> gold stands for something that's very valuable. The words in the Bible are valuable like gold. Okay, so now I want you to unwrap just the one layer. There's going to be another layer that says, just unwrap the layer of gold.
guys, as you get as you get these Bibles, you can you can take them home and you can put it on the shelf and you can keep it brand new so that we can display it when you're seniors in high school. Or you can open it up and read it. And if you show us a worn out Bible at any time between now and the time you graduate, we will give you a new one. Okay? But also, if you buy the word of the Bible is only good if you use it. If you learn it and you use it. So if you memorize ten verses by the time school starts, Melanie will give you a gift. Alright? But you have to memorize it and share it with Melanie, not everybody here. We won't ask you to do that unless you want to. Okay? So keep that in mind. If you want, there's a photo of it. Wait, stay up there for your photo. There you go. The mask wonders. Okay. Um, for special music today, and actually that goes for all the children here. If you are in children's Sunday school, you will learn how to use your Bible. But if you take the time to memorize ten scriptures at any time, when you've got all ten of them memorized, Melanie will give you a gift. All right? And um, so with that, Rhoda would like to present some special music.
love to sing it again. It has so much meaning, and even though a lot of us in our little ministries or big ministries for the Lord, we love him, and uh, I just wanted to share the song because she was so talented, and God bless her for the memory that she's given to me and all who made it. Thanks to God for his Thank you, Rhoda. People have been motivated by all sorts of things to attempt to make disciples. Some good, some not so good. But the deeper truth is that nothing will work if it is not done out of love. Before Jesus told us to go out and make disciples, he told us to love. Love one another, love your neighbor as yourself. So as we read our scriptures for today, consider this question. How do we welcome the out of love? Our gospel reading is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10, verses 40 through 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of mortals and of angels, but do not have love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give away all my possessions, and if I hand over my body so that I may boast but do not have love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love is not envious or boastful or arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing but rejoices in the truth. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. But as for prophecies, they will come to an end. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will come to an end. For we know only in part, and we prophesy only in part. But when the complete comes, the partial will come to an end. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became an adult, I put an end to childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then we will see face to face. Now I know only in part, then I will know fully, even as I have been fully known. And now faith, hope, and love abide these three, and the greatest of these is love. May God add his blessings to the reading of it. Let's pray. Loving, amazing God, you have given us words to ponder this morning. And as we think about what these words mean, Lord, and how we might apply them to our lives, help us to embody them. Lord, help us to make them part of who we are, so that what we see will be your vision. What we hear will be from your vision, and what we do will be a part of your vision. Lord, help us to be your workers, your missionaries, to build the kingdom of God. We pray this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to begin this morning by telling you a short story. It's about, it's about a doctor who decided to parachute into a foreign country. And she was equipped with valuable medicines and, and intended to land in 
in a remote village. But instead, the wind caused her parachute to drift a little bit, and she, she got caught in a tree. And as she hung suspended about 20 feet above the ground, she watched her people walk by. And after about an hour or so, she, she noticed a man walking by. And she said, excuse me, do you think you could help me get to that town over there? And he said, sure. Just take this road straight down to the village. And then he proceeded to walk past her toward the town. Now she noticed that that man was wearing a clergy collar. And, and so she, she called out, sir, sir, what do you do for a living? And he turned around and he said, ma'am, I am a pastor. I am a man of God. I should have known, said, shouted the doctor. You speak the truth, but you don't do any good. No matter how you look at it, our mission as Christians is to make disciples. And every year, somebody, somewhere, is going to come up with a new way to teach us how to do this. And, and as we said in the introduction, some of these ways are good and some of these ways are not so good. But the truth is that nothing that we do will we'll do anything at all unless it's completed out of love. And before Jesus told us to go out and make disciples, he told us to love. Love one another. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so in my final sermon to you, I would like to talk about that. Um, how do we welcome out of love? Now, a long time ago, um, I can say that now. I'm getting, um, I actually have many, many years behind me. But a long time ago, I participated in a, a diversity training. And part of that training in, included having us make a circle. And the, the facilitator took two of the people out of the room and gave them instructions. And, and those of us who were still in the room received some different instructions. And the instructions that we received was that under no uh, under, any, under no uncertain terms, there was no, no changing this. We were to prevent the people who were out of the room from getting into the circle, no matter what they did. And, and she took the, the two that, that left the room and she gave them all sorts of um, ways to try to get into the circle. They had money, they bribed us, they said nice things about us, but we stuck to our ground and we thought we were doing a great job. We kept them out of the circle. So then, the, then she sent them out again, and she gave us different, different instructions, and she said, well, if the bride is at least this much, you can let them in, or if it's chocolate. And so they came in, and they had their tools, their little toolbox, and they were trying to get into the circle, and they tried to force their way into the circle, and then they, they brought out the money, and they brought out the chocolate. And, and we let we let the, the people that we let the people who, who had enough money or had chocolate into the circle. But then she sent the people out of the room again. And she told us, she told us, we no matter what happens, if they just speak to you, go ahead and let them in the circle. But the group that was sent out of the room was told something else. And so we stood there and, and we got ready to welcome these people, these outsiders, into our circle. And then they came in and they formed their own circle and didn't even try to get into our circle. And the lesson there, as you may know, is that if you keep forcing people out, then eventually they're going to form their own group. And I think that's the world that we live in today. And, and as, I, as I thought about it, it's been a month since we had the first riots regarding the deaths. And it wasn't just the death of one individual. It's been the death of an African American or a minority or a Hispanic person month after month after month after month after month after month after month, going back about 150 years. And we need to own that. And I have been through lots and lots of clergy trainings over the last four weeks and, and constantly being told that I'm a racist, everybody's a racist, we have to own that. And I'm not going to stand here and 
call you racist because I don't believe that you are. I don't believe that I am, but I do believe that I have, I do believe that I have uh, benefited from my skin color, benefited from where I live, and benefited from the culture that I've brought, been brought up in. But I also know that I have been somewhat blind to the circumstances of the other people. The other people that have not been allowed in our circle, or who have been welcomed into our circle, but it was too late. And I think that when we start to think about hospitality, we need to, we need to think about that. We need to think about what does hospitality mean, and what did Jesus mean by hospitality? Did, how does he want us to share it? And it's not simply so that we can make more disciples. That is part of it. That's the end result. But the initial result is so that we do what Jesus did, and that is love people. Love people. And I think that's something that this church is really, really good at, is loving people. And so when we look at the gospel text today, we need to remember that it's not so much about the hospitality that we provide but about the hospitality that we receive. Because good discipleship does not leave people hanging in the branches. It recognizes that a person might need some immediate intervention. And then it honors the valuable gifts that people bring. It summons them to release those gifts in service to the vision for their lives. And then it connects them to a community such as the church where their gifts and leadership can be developed. The discipleship begins by getting the doctor out of the branches. When Jesus says, whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me, he's setting up hospitality as a standard, a standard of effectiveness. And so what, how do we measure the strength of a church or a ministry. A lot of times we want to measure it in numbers. We want to say, oh, we had, look at all the people we had here today. Or we can measure the effectiveness and how well people love each other, how much grace is being given, how much grace is being received. And as we joked about it in our lunch with the First Christian Church this past um, Tuesday, uh, we can't just sin a lot so that we receive a lot of grace. We do have to overcome our sin. And as I've talked to the, the kids who have gone through confirmation over and over again, sin isn't the, an accumulation of all the things that you do. God doesn't have time for that. Sin is that which separates us from God. And if we choose to turn away from God and accept a sinful life, that is sin. But if we, we're trying to follow God and we keep looking at God and occasionally we make a mistake, that's not sin. That's a mistake that we ask forgiveness for. But we need to remember that grace is harder to measure, but it is significant because Jesus, Jesus thinks that as well. And so Jesus calls his disciples together and he, he gets ready to send them out. And he warns them of the difficulty of the task ahead. If we read this full scripture, which is really long, he starts to say, sheep among wolves. When they, and then he says, when they hand you over. These are not things that I get excited about. He doesn't say if, he says when they hand you over. And when they persecute you in one town, then flee to the next. He doesn't say give up, he just says go to the next town. So the question I have for you is who's ready to sign up for a mission like that? You will get thrown into the wolves, you'll be persecuted, and, um, and, you, and people might turn against you and hand you over to the authorities. But Jesus does say, no, but when you do that, I've got your back. And not only do I have your back, God has your back, because this is what God wants you to do. He has numbered the hairs on your head, those of you that have hair on your head. And he says, don't be afraid, even if your hair is falling out. Because those are numbered. But what God means by that even, say, he, Jesus is saying, God has got you, but that doesn't mean that we won't struggle, that there won't be suffer, suffering, that we might lose some things. We might need to give up some of the things that we want to own. 
But loss is not eternal. And loss will not define you. And that's what we need to keep in mind. And then after all that scary stuff, Jesus concludes that these impossible mission instructions are possible because he says, well, let's figure out how this is going to work. And he talks about welcoming or being welcomed. And he says, whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, and he's got children in the crowd, so he's pointing to the children. He says, to you. But what he really means is to you, people who come in my name. The little ones are the beginners, the ones just starting out in faith just making their first foray into the mission field, the third graders who just received their Bibles. But then he talks about in the name of a disciple. And so what, what is Jesus, what is happening in that? Because Jesus doesn't say just go out and do without a purpose. He's talking again about discipleship. And I go back to the, the a long time ago, it really wasn't that long ago, but I started working at, at Camp Crosley in, um, in northwestern Indiana, and we got to about a couple of weeks before the first before the first um, week of camp, and the, the director says, and, and can you tell me what the rainy day plan is? Now, I had never had the summer in Indiana before, and I just said, I don't need a rainy day plan. Jesus loves me. And, um, <laughs> and, and he said, you know, that may be true, but that's not enough for camp. You need to have a plan. And lo and behold, that was one of our typical Indiana summers where it rains every single day. I had never, ever experienced that in New York. In New York, we would sometimes go 30 days without rain to the point that the, the lake, which was really a damn stream, the lake would become a muddy puddle. And we would have to force the children into the water for swimming because it was so hot. That was my experience of summer. But no, we were in Indiana where it's 95 degrees, and then just before you start the general swim time, there's a thunderstorm. That was my first experience of camping. And so I learned that, that yes, Jesus might love me, but I need a plan. And, um, and so we came up with some plans, and we managed to get through those summers um, that alternated. One year there'd be lots of like, rain, and the next year there'd be no rain at all. But we need to... We need to remember that hospitality, like love, is not just a one-time thing or a one-time experience. It's a way of life, and it's a way of living and being in the world. And so when Jesus starts talking about discipleship in terms of hospitality, he's, he's talking about hospitality that's done in Jesus' name. Hospitality that's done for them. He's talking about the effect of their mission. He's talking about what they might receive if they do what they're called to do. And he's talking about the impact that the disciples will have on the people that they encounter. He's talking about loving people enough to welcome and be welcomed. And so we ask, what is it that Jesus says? What is, what is he saying when he says, you will be welcome if you are a welcoming presence? What he's saying is that you'll transform lives, even if only small, seemingly insignificant ways, like offering a, a cup of water on a hot day when you have nothing else to offer. The person may need a house, but if you at least have hospitality and offer them something to make them feel more comfortable, they're going to see you as a person of loving presence. We need to make sure that, that we can do that, and the only way we can do that is if we're transformed ourselves. Because it's not our words that bring grace. It's our whole being. It's our whole presence. And that's why it's possible for a church to say, we welcome everyone, but not be a welcoming presence. We can say everyone is invited but then put up all kinds of barriers in how we interact with the stranger in our midst. That goes back to that demonstration I talked about earlier. We can say everyone is included, even though our attitudes and behaviors up to that point 
have been exclusive. When we open our mouths, it has to be preceded by opening our hearts because then love is poured out. And Jesus doesn't give us a script to follow. He never tells the disciples what to say, but he says, as you proclaim the good news, and we have to know what that good news is. The implication is that the good news is proclaimed as much through our living as it is through our speaking. People come because they see who we are first and they want to be a part of our group. And, it, and then what we say is also important because eventually we have to give an account of the hope that lives within us. And the ones, Jesus says, the ones who won't lose their reward are the people who give cups of water, not the people who are able to memorize the Bible, although that is important. I'll be left. Okay. Um, because if you don't know what's in the Bible, you don't know how to live it. And so, when we think of hospitality, we have to embody it, and we have to be able to say, okay, we're in this situation in this world where we know that maybe we aren't personally responsible, but we are a part of it. So how can we change the world that we live in? Well, we can't go out and wave a magic wand and then make everybody, everybody be inclusive and, and responsible. But what we can do is change the world one person at a time. What we can do is to continue doing what you have done for years and years and years. In the 1970s, there was a ministry here um, that, that worked, with, worked with migrant workers. And this church opened itself up and became a daycare for the children of the migrant workers so that the children wouldn't have to be in the fields. Because what was happening was the, the government passed a law. That's what governments do is they pass laws. And they said, it's illegal to have children under a certain age out in the fields. And that's a good law, we think. Where, where it did damage was the parents would watch the kids while they were picking the crops. And so in order to have child care, the, then the, the older kids who would normally be in school had to stay home to watch the kids while the parents were picking the crops. And so our law, which was there to protect children, was actually hurting children. And so there was a group from Texas that said, hey, let's provide daycare. And they, they came to the Catholic Church first, and then their school opened up, and then they were here. But the stories and the stories and the stories that are out there about the love, the love, the, the people, the women who took care of the kids. Just the, if we, I, I laughed about it for a while because if we were to do those same things in our preschool today, we would be shut down immediately. But what was done was done in love because, you know, they would bathe the kids and they would do some things that were like, oh, wait a minute, um, you can't do that. But we didn't have air conditioning, so, you know, we, there's different things that happen. The kids would run around in their diapers and stuff. But they were here, there was about 70 kids 70 kids that were taken care of in our education building that was just empty during the week. And, and, and this, again, the, the stories of love that is poured out by our being able to take care of kids from the age of zero all the way up to about 10 years old was amazing. This church has a lot of love within it. And because of that love, hospitality is possible. And so when we hear things out in the world and we cringe because we say, oh, well, that's tension, that's causing problems. We should not, we should not ne neglect our responsibility to act, to be anti-racist. We don't have to be a racist. Not every, I, don't, I still don't believe that every single person is a racist, but I do believe that, that not all of us are anti-racist. And anti-racists are people who take steps to get to know the people that are of different races and different cultures. And so that's the challenge that's before us. The challenge to accept the, uh, the challenge that's given to us. And so when we hear something like Black Lives Matter, we know that that's a thing. We know that that's important. And we don't try to devalue it by saying, well, let's combine it with other terms to make it more inclusive. Because I think sometimes we, we become more damaging when we do stuff like that. Hospitality is love, and love is respect. 
and love is everything that we read about in 1 Corinthians 13. The hospitality that we receive is related to the hospitality that we give. The love that we give is related to the love that we receive, and that's how it, how it works. We can't scare people into the arms of God, but we can love them there. We can't force people into the fellowship of the church, but we can welcome them there. And this text tells us that hospitality is not an add-on. It's not an extra in the busyness of our mission and ministry. It's the core. It's what defines us. And a, and a quote that's sometimes attributed to the poet Maya Angelou really works here. She says, I've learned that people will forget what you said. People will, for, will forget what you did. But people will never forget how you made them feel. So no matter who originally said it, we can all sense the truth in it. There's something significant in how we are welcome and how we welcome. Jesus is telling the disciples that in this road or in this challenge of making disciples, sharing the good news will be difficult, but there's blessings to be found on it. And, and often those blessings are very small, and they're simple, and they're likely to be overlooked. But if we open our eyes, if we open our ears, and we open our hearts, we'll begin to experience all of the treasures that are in the kingdom of God right now. God challenges us to make disciples, and discipleship is laden with love. Now before we continue with our closing prayer, we have one more unfinished business to take care of. And um, a couple weeks ago, we had, we had several youth profess their faith. And so we're not going to have them do it again, but I need all of you guys to come back, come down here. So you three and Sam and you three up there. And then Michael McMahon's not able to be with us today, but he was a part. He was also confirmed. And I told him we had gifts. And of course, Snow and Coatsbury, they always do the best thing. They you need to stand faith this time facing that way, six feet apart. Unless you're related. <laughs> All right. And um, anyway, I, Pokesbury always gets things the day after. So I, I told him I had gifts for them, but we'll give them the gifts later. But as the longs come down, what I'd like you all to do, this is a hymnal. Remember? So they're in front of you. Hey, turn to page 36. In order to be confirmed, the kids have to go through, um, the, in this case, years of instruction. Um, it wasn't every single week, but every once in a while I throw in a lesson about faith and Jesus and all of our traditions. And they learn through the years. They learned in Sunday school. They learn through youth group. But we, um, in that, they learn about faith, and then they get to the point where they're confident that they can profess their faith. And we also, at the same time, baptized him, and, um, and those are important. And as we want to remember that it's through baptism and confirmation, it's through the reaffirmation of our faith that we renew the covenant declared at our baptism, acknowledging what God is doing for us, and we affirm our commitment to Christ's holy church. So the first thing I do is I ask them the historic questions, and so we're just going to show you that so that you can hear their responses. So go ahead and click that, and we'll go ahead. You guys just stand here. Are you willing 
conquering. Um, but as we try to limit the touching of objects and among people, we'll continue to have the offering plates at the back of the church. But let's pray together. Loving and amazing guys, we enter into this final time of prayer. We ask that you would help us to let go of what is past. Release us from the anger and resentments and hurts of days gone by and free us from the bitterness and help us to fill this space with the love of Christ. We offer our gratitude for the gift of love. We offer our thanks for the people in our lives who love us unconditionally. We offer our thanks for those who provide a safe place in the shelter of their unselfish love. We offer our praise for those who give, expecting nothing in return for the gift. We offer our gratitude to those who cause us to rise to our greater selves. We offer thanks for those who help us to put the pieces of our lives back together when dreams and hopes are shattered. And Lord, we take time today to remember those in need of your comforting presence. We pray for Julie, Jack, Valerie Ann, Norma, Doug, Lynn, Rhoda, Aaron, Roger, Steve, DJ, Terry, Vance, Sophia, Ashley, Bob, Reverend Mark, Avery, Ben, Will, Caitlin, Bernita, Julie, Mike, Steve and Tina, Aaron, Phyllis, Michelle, Roslyn, Barb, James, and all others who should be on this list but are named in our hearts. Lord, we pray for the family of Dana Hart as they grieve the loss of their loved one. And Lord, as we gather, we also pray for the congregation here. I give them to you, Lord, and place, place them in your hands, knowing that they are fully capable of continuing the work that we have had over these last few years. Lord, you have nurtured this community. You have nurtured this church, and you know the possibilities and the future and the end of the story. So continue to bring this congregation along that journey, Lord. Continue to offer hope and love, and continue to bless them in everything that they do, in everything that they say. Lord, I know that you hear our innermost desires every single day. But it is because of you that we are able to cast away our fears and anxieties. It is because of Jesus we are able to lay it all before you, knowing that you will carry us through. And while we honor the past, we also look forward to the future with hope and love. All of this we pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. And while he was with us, Lord, he taught us to pray. And so we close our prayer time together by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And we will close today by singing my favorite song, Shepherd of My Soul.
So we hope you will come down and enjoy some refreshments and share some, some words of encouragement for her. And along with the changeover in our pastor, we are also doing a lot of work on the parsonage. So I just wanted to uh, make sure you all knew that if you can help out in any way, we're going to start um, working on the parsonage on Thursday. I think that's the second. Um, we have some painting to do and things like that. And um, would be grateful for any help. The strat team and the trustees have already started a little bit of work, but. If you're not into painting, that's okay. We've got a little bit of outside work and things like that. So let me know if you can make it either. Um, we're going to try and work on most of it Thursday and Friday. And our, our new pastor, um, Pastor Sam, moves in on the 8th. So we have a quick turnaround. So we'd appreciate any kind of help that we can receive from anybody that's here today. Thank you. And even though this is my last Sunday, the new person is not here till the 8th, there will be worship on July 5th. Alright, so just so you know that we have some, but we have a plan. Um, it's been it's been an amazing journey. Um, I kind of think of, sometimes I think of the Methodist itinerant si um, uh, system as the runners that they used to have in the Old Testament. That's how they got messages back and forth. You would run from as far as you could really to the to the town next town and then hand off the message to the next one and they would go to the next town until it got where it was going and I think that that I've had an opportunity to serve you for five years I've loved it I've loved every minute of it um, even the hard minutes I still when I had a chance to reflect I love those minutes and and I just ask that you and, and can encourage you to continue to offer the same love and hospitality that you offer to me to everyone that follows me um, this is probably the most the, the most fully equipped church that I've encountered along my journey there's a lot of things that we had to had to work through in the first couple of months but after we got through them we just started to blossom so it's just you are you're ready you're there but I thank you because you have been a great support and you've offered me a tremendous amount of love for five years. I appreciate it. But now I want to leave you with these words from St. Paul. Finally, brothers and sisters, farewell. Put things in order. Listen to my appeal. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of love and peace will be with you. Greet one another with a holy kiss, but not yet. <laughs> All the saints greet you. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit will be with you always. Go in peace.